a temple of sciences with gothic vaulting and glass ceiling, celebrating the natural forms and materials. This is how Charles Dobney, professor of chemistry and botany, imagined the central court of today's Oxford University Museum of Natural History. However, the museum might have looked quite differently from how it looks today, had the funds not run out. The building's decoration remained unfinished, but the walls were supposed to be adorned with Arturian scenes. These drawings, exhibited in the central court of the museum, offer us a glimpse into the original designs envisaged by Dante Gabriel Rossetti, John Ruskin and other Pre-Raphaelites. The Museum of Natural History's intended design of Aturian scenes to be painted on the walls on the central court bears a striking resemblance to the Oxford Union Society debating chamber, now the library of the society. They were painted between 1857 and 1859 by Dante Gabriel Rossetti, William Morris, Edward Burne Jones and some other close friends and members of the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood. In the long vacation of 1857, Rossetti went to see his friend, the architect Benjamin Woodward was working in buildings for both the Museum of Natural History and Union Society. He was struck by the possibilities offered by the gallery walls of the newly completed debating chamber. The roof beams divide these walls into ten bays, each containing two six four windows. In line with principles expounded by Ruskin, the artists were to give freely of their time, the Union defraying the cost of materials, scaffolding, lodging, travel and provisions. The senselessness, imagery, symbolism, mystery of the Pre-Raphaelites, an equality often cruel and melancholy, generated fascination around the murals and the artists. In order to provide a more even illumination, the windows of the hall were whitewashed. The cleaning of whitewash from the windows had the immediate effect of making the murals almost invisible. The adoption of a style of colouring so brilliant as to make the walls look like the margin of a highly illuminated manuscript. This is how their work was described by Padmore. All kinds of quaint beasts and birds, according to Burne Jones, peered from the foliage on the roof. The group had hopes to finish the paintings in six weeks. However, the work took much longer and was never completed. Like for the Union Society debating chamber, it was the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood which profoundly impacted the architectural formula adopted in choosing the style of the museum. Ruskin and his followers believed that one could only create great art by abandoning conventional generalized views of the visible world and instead carefully observing the minutest details of shape, tone and colour in a realism that permitted to descend to the details of the natural world and yet create a work in which almost every detail had meaning. The story of the museum revolves around one particular painting, Everett Millet's portrait of John Ruskin, part of the Western Art Department of the Ishmolean Museum in Oxford. The Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood was formed in September 1848 in the London studio of John Everett Millet. Although they had no clear manifesto, the members were all devoted to truth to nature, which for the five years or so of the Brotherhood's existence required a meticulously detailed style of painting. It was John Ruskin's father who commissioned Millet's celebrated portrait of his son. It was begun while the author and sitter were on holiday in the summer of 1853 at Brigger Turk in the Trossachs near Stirling. The portrait was begun in July with Ruskin's old Oxford friend, Sir Henry Ackland, to whom the museum owes its existence, holding the canvas. Crucially, Ackland was also a college friend of Ruskin at Christchurch, who became one of the foremost thinkers of art and architecture of the Victorian age. This was not the first time that Miller had painted outdoors, but it was an experience fraught with difficulties. Most of the background was completed by the end of October, and the figure of Ruskin was painted from life in Millet's studio in London in the following year. The painting was completed with increased reluctance, as Millet was falling in love with Ruskin's wife Effie. The affair eventually led to the dissolution of Ruskin's marriage, and Millet married Effie. As the portrait became distasteful to Ruskin, he offered it to Henry Ackland. The museum is today a stunning example of Victorian neo-Gothic architecture. Ruskin played a crucial role in determining the final appearance of the building. The style for the new museum was an open competition held by the university to design the new home for science at Oxford. This came to be known as the Battle of Stars, with prizes offered for the three best designs, with a cost limit of £30,000. Two designs were selected by the body of the convocation, 
a classical design by Ian e. Barry, and a neo-gothic design by the firm of Dean and Woodward, Dublin, which won the competition. The design was influenced by John Ruskin, particularly in its use of material and decoration. Ruskin had particular ideological reasons to prefer the Gothic style, but among the arguments which favoured its adoption were that a medieval university should have a Gothic revival museum. The most striking aspect of the museum is the glass and iron roof of the central court. The building is constructed around the centre glazed court, intended to display the specimens. The settings and displays are arranged much as they were 150 years ago. The use of glass and cast iron have been commonplace since the mid-1840s, especially in galleries and greenhouses. One of the novel aspects of the museum was the use of structural iron, but since the first design of the roof used mainly wrought iron, the structure was incapable of supporting its own weight. Cast iron columns ornamented with wrought ironwork and the spandrels representing the branches of species were put in place. From the inside, the museum bears resemblance to the great medieval Gothic cathedrals of France. The ceiling is triveted, echoing the knob and nails of a medieval cathedral. The upper gallery passage of the museum reminds of the experiments of the delicate two-layer treatment of walls, with hollow-out passages at the level of the Gothic triforium, during what came to be known as the 12th century Renaissance. Now, Ruskin first got excited by the museum when it was decided that the building was to be designed in the Gothic style, a melding of Flemish, French, Italian and English medieval forms. The museum combines this medieval design with a more modern approach. Steel and glass structures recall the grandeur of major railway stations developing at that time all over the country. In 1760s, the association of this space was both historical and strikingly modern. This kind of glazed structure being the avant-garde of modern display methods. It was already recognised that extensions to the museum would soon be required and Gothic style was felt to accommodate irregular expansion particularly well. In Gothic art, spatial magnificence is essential to designing a stable yet aesthetically pleasing construction. While Gothic was in the Middle Ages the expression of an ecclesiastical architecture, this aspect was not part of the contemporary debate about the building and its style. Yet the traces of the grandeur of the House of the Divine Architect who created the cosmos are unmistakable. Ackland himself considered the building a name to God's creation, a means to exhibit God's second book. The idea of nature as God's second book is a trope of natural theology. People who subscribed to this way of thinking saw nature as an illustration of the power of the Creator. The message to those who entered was clear. This was an edifice where science describes and celebrates the work of the divine architect. Contrary to Ruskin's belief, he considered that external decoration was the most important in giving the greatest pleasure to the visitors. The university felt that it was more important to decorate the interior than the exterior. University funds and donations were therefore mainly directed towards the embellishment of the interior. Statues were placed around the court to commemorate a number of eminent figures, such as Aristotle, Galileo, Roger Bacon and Isaac Newton, amongst others. These statues were intended to create the pantheon of science as it was perceived in the 1850s. On the inner bases of the columns, the name and origin of rocks are inscribed. One can imagine an early geological lecturer circulating around the court, much as monks in cathedral schools had circulated cathedral and abbey cloisters hundreds of years before. The decorated cloister capitals of the columns represent the most beautiful element in the decoration of the building, each one being unique in its ornament. The capitals of the cloister and of the upper gallery embody two central tenets of the Ruskinian Gothic revival, namely that decorative art should take inspiration directly from nature and that architectural ornament 
should be executed by the man who designed it. At the museum, these tenets were indicative of the respect for the dignity of artistic labour, and the Oshi brothers were brought from Ireland to accomplish the decorative work. During the works each morning, the museum's first keeper would procure specimens from the botanical gardens for the sculptors to carve. The decorations of the columns exhibited a considerable variety, from elements of fauna, informal bouquets of great delicacy and naturalism, to natural forms arranged into formal repeating patterns, anticipating Morris and liberty design. The museum officially opened in 1860 and the grandeur of its spatial magnificence remained true to Ackland's belief that every educated man should learn something from the sciences. It was Ackland, who concerned for the inadequate provision for the study of sciences in Oxford, campaigned for this large building that would house research and teaching facilities, and which would bring together collections that were dispersed across the university. The edifice was to provide teaching space suitable to the dignity of a new honor school with science departments such as medicine, anatomy, geology, mineralogy, chemistry, astronomy, and geometry, amongst others. <laughs>